All right, let's get kind of a state of in-state basketball with a guy who knows in-state basketball at the prep and college level is like no other. It's Joe Hendrickson of City Suburban Hoops Report. And, and Joe, the, you know, this is a proud state when it comes to, to basketball, both high school and college. Um, but it was finally nice, um, I guess, the last couple of years that we've actually had some in-state programs who actually are in the middle of, uh, you know, national relevance, whether it's Loyola, you know, Northwestern a couple of years ago, and now Illinois uh, joins the mix. Even, even Bradley has, has made the tournament a couple of times. Um, it's, it's nice to actually have some of these teams in the mix here uh, coming into March. Yeah. We had a five year, six year, just a, ugh, you know, it was, it was some tough going and, and to be able to have two teams ranked, you think about that. I mean, two teams were ranked and, you know, while well, Loyola was underseated, as we all kind of know by now, but uh, to have them be relevant is huge, you know, and in the Missouri Valley, since Loyola moved to that Missouri Valley Conference, you know, it, it's a league that's just so heavy Illinois with Southern and Bradley and Illinois State and, and Loyola, and, it, and it's something the state really uh, can benefit from when that league is hopping with, and particularly with the teams in our state at the top. But, yeah, it was a lot of fun, obviously, Illinois and, and Loyola playing in March. I, I want to ask you, did you like the idea of them in the same bracket playing each other, or would you have rather had them just completely – no, I hated it. The NCAA tournament loves those storylines, of course. Right. I remember, you know, 2011, they had Kruger, Self, and Weber in the same pod. Uh, no, I, I don't like that because as a guy who's in state, I mean, I love Loyola. I think they're so much fun to watch. It's an easy program to root for. But I, I just, I thought that was a lot for a second round matchup. And as you said, I think they were a little underseeded. I understand the Missouri Valley wasn't very good this year, but they were dominant in it. And, and I just thought the matchup was... I didn't think it would be that difficult, Joe, to be honest with you. I thought Illinois just talent wise had too much, but um, obviously Loyola had the right game plan. And I think Illinois' lack of NCAA tournament experience showed a little bit. Yeah. I'm mean, talking to coach, you know, Porter Mosier uh, leading up to that week. And, you know, everybody's talking about under C, but, he, you know, he and I were talking about it. he didn't expect much higher than an eight. You know, he was, he was, he was thinking eight, nine. Um, with the hope that there's a seven just because of, I think of factors that, you know, in my mind, they were a, they were a, like a six or seven, you know, and, and which would have gotten off that line with Illinois. And uh, it, it would just been nice to see how, how, you know, those two teams would have done without meeting that early and maybe not sweet 16, a little different, but uh, that's been talked to death. <laughs> well, Joe, but despite that bad ending for Illinois, um, what a season this was for them. What a two seasons it was. And it's a shame they didn't get in the tournament uh, the year before because of the, the pandemic. But um, I, I know why this Illinois staff was able to have success, right? They got talent. They, they, they got two great talents in Iowa and Kofi, and, and now you add Curbelo to the mix. And they won a lot of Big Ten games with them. But um, how much has changed about the perception of this program now? Uh, In-state coaching circles, how much is different for Illinois now than before Brad Underwood got there? I'm going to start with a negative first. <laughs> the negative is that last year, you know, that was the year, all right, you're going to be uh, selection Sunday, get in the dance, celebrate, finally getting in the tournament, and they miss that. So you miss a lot of that juice from that. Then you have this COVID season. You, 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 you do it again. You get back in the tournament. You get the one seed everyone's anticipating expecting this deep run to even add to the kind of the, uh, the rise of the program. And then boom, you get upset. So it, it just feels like there's just this missing next step of, as far as pure relevancy in the state. Now the positive is there's no question, you know, the strides they've made as a program, uh, you know, really, translates to, to to becoming more of a bigger player in the state of Illinois with future recruits. Now to Illinois credit, they've gone out of state and recruited out of state pro prospects more so than any coach and staff and the program's ever done in history. Um, and, and, and a good timing because there just has not been a surplus of high major legitimate guys that Illinois would be able to target. We're seeing a little bit of a shift towards that with more players and that should pay off pay dividends with this kind of success, this kind of run, uh, you just now, the concern is, this, this, can you sustain it? Right. And 
in today's college game, you see it at Illinois. It's a microcosm of what's happening in college basketball. You, you, it is so difficult to kind of maintain these programs. You can assemble teams. You can put together teams for a year or two. But to kind of the, this transition that Illinois is going to face now with the departures and who knows who else is leaving or staying and coming, and uh, that's going to be the next chore task for, for Underwood and the staff to just kind of maintain and push forward and keep – you don't want to sit in a bubble anymore. You know, Illinois is a prop program that that was basically in the tournament eight times out of 10 uh, for a good 20 year run, 25 year run. And that's what you want to get back to. Um, back to my first point. I just feel like you missed a little bit of that, that extra excitement, the extra aura around the program by COVID stripping them of the tournament in uh, two years ago. And then this, you know, a, a pretty stunning upset uh, when you all things considered. Uh, when you were all kind of all, I mean, not only were they a one seed, but they were a one seed that you guys, I'm sure you've written and talked talk, talked about that was playing so unbelievably well. Other than Baylor and Gonzaga, I mean, they were the team. And to stub their toe early, you know, it, it hurts with the question you ask with the perception of the program. Yeah, I think just even a week, just another week of basketball, Joe, whether it's Sweet 16 they lose or, you know, Elite Eight they lose, it's just that buzz for a week and, and people talking about Iowa, I think, would have been huge. And then you follow it, Joe, with this surprise, at least here, uh, that Adam Miller enters the transfer portal. I guess we shouldn't be surprised, as you said, with any of this anymore, but I know you're so plugged in with some college coaches and you know these guys, like, what is the reaction to this? Uh, Cause I know Brad Underwood is sitting there trying to figure out how, how do I go about putting together rosters and trying to sustain rosters anymore? Cause the way I want to get high school prospects, develop them um, that might not be the realistic way to do it anymore. There is a lot of frustration among college coaches. Uh, you know, I had a, uh, you know, a mid-major plus head coach talk to me. He says, Joe, I'm not going to recruit high school kids anymore. Uh, sorry, hurts my business to the recruiting service guy that subscribes to my recruiting service. But no, he, he just said, Joe, I bring in three guys. I bring in three guys in a freshman class. Uh, two of them are just not ready. They're, they're not physically ready. They're not mentally ready. They don't play much. Those two kids in the today's age are upset, frustrated because they're not playing. They want immediate playing time. They leave, they transfer. The other one maybe is really good, has an all freshman type uh, league, all freshman league um, season, and comes back for a sophomore year and is a star and he leaves. So now you got the your whole freshman class is gone. You know, it, it is, there's frustration, as I mentioned. Um, there's no real answer to it. And, and, and the rules that are in place now uh, just augment that to the point where you're going to have to adjust. Uh, some of the old school guys are really having a problem with it. Uh, some of them that are more positive, uh, you know, say you got to roll with the punches. I got to deal with it. But it is putting together rosters for a year. It's going to be really hard. And I think it's going to be really tough at the mid-major and low-major yep. level. Uh, those I, I feel for those programs. You know, you think about like a run that, you know, Bruce Weber and, and, and Chris Lowry and those guys had at Southern Illinois. I just don't know how that's ever going to, to happen again. You know, that where you got the four five, six year run where you are at the top of the mid major level. And, you know, we'll see with Loyola um, what happens here. Obviously Porter Mosier is gone, but uh, they are built to, to be, to be really good next year. Uh, we'll see if that, that happens, but I think frustration is, is definitely the key word. Yeah. I think uh, I was going to say that like, you know, Illinois fans could sit there and be like, man, this, this is tough, but mid majors, it's, it's a completely different uh, level. You got to find like this medium of guys getting guys who are good, but not too good. That's <laughs> where they leave early. Uh, let's, let's bring up Loyola because what a job Porter Moser did uh, his second stint is a Missouri Valley uh, head coach. And he parlays this finally into the Oklahoma job, which I think is a great get for them. Uh, why was he successful, Joe at Loyola? What, what did he do that others whether it's in Missouri Valley programs in the state or the Chicago area programs weren't able to do? Well, I think the biggest thing without question is he, two things, he, he stuck with the plan. He didn't waver from his plan, his model, his vision of what he wanted. 
uh, even when if people forget they had some struggles in the early going. Uh, and the second part of that is Lyola gave him time to do it. You know, what people forget too, is they were in the horizon league. He was, he took over a, a really downtrodden program. They hadn't done anything for years. It's been documented. And he had started to form this roster that would be, be able to compute, co compete in the horizon league at the time. Well, then two years in, they moved to Missouri Valley. And it's a jump up. It's a step up. Uh, so you're being in the middle of the pack horizon. You're finally clawing, fighting your way, clawing your way up that ladder in the horizon league. You feel like year three, you got a roster to do so. Poof, they're in the valley. They drop back down, bottom of the bunch of the valley. He stuck with it. And, and, and man, he's preached and preached culture. They all preach culture, Jeremy. Every press conference, every uh, time they, they talk about the recruiting classes that come in. Uh, every time they, it, it's culture, culture, culture. Yeah. I, I just see so many uh, programs from the outside, the type of players they bring in, uh, even some from Illinois. Uh, it's BS. You're, you're not concerned about culture <clears throat> when you're planning on dealing with some of the issues that, that you're going to deal with. Uh, with certain, you know, you're not going to have all angels, but you can't have a roster full of, of, of devils. And you know, I just think that Porter stayed true to what he believed. Uh, he, he, he stayed in his lane. I remember a phone conversation I had with him after the Final Four. Uh, it, it was in April. Uh, you know, all the buzz and everybody's, you know, and you're talking about, oh, Lyle can go out and recruit higher-level guys now. You went to the Final Four. I remember him saying, Joe, I just got to make sure that – that I keep recruiting the same. I, I might be able to get a more higher rank kid, but he may not fit me. He may not be ideal for what we're building here, what we're all about. And he stayed true to that. Uh, and he added these pieces to, to you know, uh, to that final four roster. The only really left over was Crutwig and Lucas Williamson. And he stayed true to that. And that's going to be the, his key. I talked to him about it at Oklahoma. Uh, how do you do that? avoid you know you got to recruit a higher level player there's no question in Oklahoma but the temptation is there when you're hot to like oh can I go get a kid I really wasn't able to get before even though he doesn't quite fit what I, I my ideals are so I think that is is really led to their their success and to maintain it even after that final four run uh because a lot of programs would you know you know falter a little bit and, and take a step back. And I mean, this team got to the sweet 16. Um, you know, a, a lot of people were picking them to go to the final four once they beat Illinois. Uh, but you know, it, it, that one game, the tournament, you don't know, you know, from game to game, you don't know the result, man. It, 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 we saw that with Gonzaga, that last championship night. So they, they make the in-house hire with Drew Valentine, which I think makes some sense, uh, Joe, from the outset. What do you think? Like what, you know, very young guy, youngest, I think, Division One coach. What, what do you think of his fit there? I'm a big fan of Drew. Gotten to know him well since he's been at Loyola. He is young. He is inexperienced. He's going to have some obstacles that he's going to have to deal with as a first-year coach, being that young and not being through the grind of a lot of this that they have to deal with as a first-time coach. Uh, you know, the the you know the 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 the, the people who will say, "Oh man, Loyola has an opportunity here." with that roster and the resources that they have funneled into that program to go out and get a, a really big name uh, coach for a mid-major or to see, at least open it up and see what would we have gotten if, if we opened it up. But um, just knowing Porter, knowing the program, I, you know, I, I was kind of in tune with what they had in mind in terms of staying in house to keep that, uh, familiarity within the program. We've seen it all over the country. We, you know, before Mark Few, you know, Dan Monson to Mark Few, we've seen it at Butler. We've seen it at Xavier, uh, a little bit higher level programs, but you know, Loyola had that same mindset. They weren't going to mess around with search firms. They weren't, they were going to hire somebody they knew and they were familiar and comfortable with. Uh, so I, you know, right now, I don't expect Cameron Crutway to come back. But right now, I do expect the the majority or the rest of that roster to come back intact, which you know puts them in the top two or three in the valley again next year with a big time recruit coming in, T.Y. Johnson out of DePaul Prep, who you know he's a fringe 
you know, he's a fringe borderline high major who ended up at Loyola. Pretty big deal for them. Uh, I got to ask you about the, the school in Chicago that, you know, probably has had a low floor every year, but everyone still thinks they have a high ceiling in that city. And that's DePaul. Uh, they make another coaching change. Dwayne Peavy, the new AD comes in there and hires Oregon assistant, Tony Stubblefield. Um, Joe, what do you think of that fit? And, and what is the model for success at DePaul? The model for success was somehow convincing and being able to pay Porter Moser to go to DePaul. Uh, and I, I say that with all 100% conviction. Uh, he, he made the most sense. I wrote about it. Uh, those two sides didn't really even come close to that materializing at all, partly because of money. Um, there was a misnomer with, you know, I got some feedback and information that Paul had a ton of money, ready to go big, three plus million. Wow. And that at the end of the day, that was not true. Um, misinformation. <laughs> but the, the process, um, without getting into details, was a was a, a little bit of a messy uh, coaching search process. And, you know, I don't know Tony Stubblefield. I am well aware of him and, and, and familiar with a lot of people that are familiar with him. Obviously, he's got a big name as far as recruiting. But uh, I, I felt it was a different type of hire than I expected. Um, you know, there's – there's a lot of change. They've got a new president, new athletic director. Um, they're kind of stripping things down and they needed to. Uh, there are some major hurdles off campus arena. The practice facility situation is not ideal. Uh, the, you know, now with their head coach, we'll see what they happen to do with their staff. You, you have, you don't necessarily, it's a little like Illinois, uh, you know, with Illinois, you, you you don't necessarily have to get the Jabari Parkers, Jaleel Okafors to, to, to say you're going to recruit Chicago. You can get those second tier guys. I mean, it, 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 it's, it behooved Northwestern to do so with the Vic Laws of the world. And, and, and DePaul can do the same thing. Uh, I, I just think the model there is, you know, I was talking with some of the coaching candidates, Jeremy, who were interviewing, trying to get the job. Uh, that were in the final three or four. And one of the things I have always believed that Paul should invest in, and one of the is interesting, one of the head coach, or one of the cat candidates when I was talking about this was 100% on board. And, and that was the model they wanted international uh, yeah. direct flights to Chicago, big city, the international players, they don't care. They don't know the difference between Paul and Detroit. And uh, you know, they, to get a coach on staff, which is, you know, easier said than done because there's not a ton of guys with strong ties and connections internationally. But I think that's one route to go at DePaul. Uh, you know, the other thing is, again, to establish a staff, as bad as DePaul has been, uh, and I know you, you're Illinois-based here, but kids in Chicago still wouldn't mind playing at DePaul. Um but they've been so bad with zero direction. It's been incompetence for years uh, across the board. And th th there's nothing, there's been nothing to sell. I mean, nothing. So fresh start, Stubblefield comes in. We'll see what happens with the staff. Uh, I'm, there's a lot of, you know, you mentioned high upside program. I'm one of those believers. I've always believed, but it's been dormant for so long. Uh, and it's really challenging. Uh, to, to get that up and running again. Yeah, they've had four NBA draft picks since Illinois had one with Myers, right? So like they still have, have been able to get some uh, talent there, including Paul Reed here uh, very recently. But yeah, we keep hearing sleeping giant with, with them. It's like Illinois football. And it's like, well, at some point you're just sleeping and you're not really a giant any, anymore. Um, I, I do want to ask you, you mentioned Northwestern there. And uh, one of the most impressive coaching jobs is Chris Collins and, and getting them in the tournament, almost upsetting Gonzaga. Uh, but uh, they weren't able really to parlay that. Joe, uh, into more success. And I think we all know Northwestern might be capped a little bit uh, with their ceiling, but why weren't they able to capitalize? Like what, what happened there in the last couple of years? I think the, the first, if you remember, they came back uh, and they were poised to win big that next year and they were hit hard by injuries and they lost a lot of that. You know, they weren't built as a program to sustain you know, m most programs aren't, but uh, they had some key injuries. It, it just went off the rails. 
And I think if they had been able to capitalize that second year and maybe make a return trip, which, you know, they returned most of that team from that NCAA tournament team. And it just, it went down quick. Uh, and, and they were never able to recapture that. The reason why, well, I, I just think it's, it, they, they, it is a difficult place to recruit to. It, it's the bottom line. And, and your pool of players has been well-documented. It, it's smaller. Uh, they, and, and it's, here's an underrated piece of this right now. They are not built for today's college basketball world with this transfer portal. Uh, Northwestern is not taking a ton of transfers. They can't get in a ton of transfers. It's, it's a challenging piece that they got to navigate. Uh, you know, now we're looking, I think they have finished their last or second to last three straight years. Uh, and that's a side, Joe, I think most people don't uh, consider with transfers. And I've seen it with football, too, with Illinois. It's the academic, like the transfers uh, credits coming over. It's, it's, a, it's a different process that I think most fans don't think of. Right, right. Uh, and, and obviously, you, you, you times that by two a lot with a, with a school like a Northwestern or Stanford and something like that. So, you know, it, it, it's getting tricky right now. Again, you, you, you're going down this, this slide as a Northwestern program. Now, and, and they just had, um, you know, the loss of Miller Cop transferred. He was their leading scorer, second leading scorer. Uh, but they still do return three double-figure scores. Um, you know, they, they've got a couple of big men back, uh, you know, and Ryan Young and, and uh, Robbie Barron. The recruiting class coming in is not – doesn't – it doesn't open your eyes too much. So, I think next year, though, is imperative that they – I think they can inch their way up to being a, a middle, mid-level Big Ten team, which would put them hopefully on the bubble. You know, if there is, you know, they should be fighting and clawing for that seventh, eighth, you know, spot in the Big Ten, and that's your ceiling. And that's where you got to get eventually uh, in the Big Ten if you, if you want to be in the NCAA tournament conversation. And, um, you know, that league has been such a beast that it is such a hard, that's, that's why the job is not viewed as, as a great job. There's these other factors we talked about, the academics, uh, the lack of interest. There's, there's just no interest for Northwestern, even up here in the Chicago area. It's just, it's the way it is. And, and it's always been that way. Uh, so you factor that stuff in with the transfer thing that we mentioned. Uh, and then that, just that grind of the Big Ten. Uh, you saw that this year. I mean, what they three and zero? I think they started three and zero in the Big Ten this year. Uh, lost, I believe, thirteen straight. So it, it, next year is a huge year for Northwestern. Yeah, and they just lost Emmanuel Dildy, who's assistant leaving, going with Porter Mosier to Oklahoma. Uh, so to fill that spot as well. Yeah, especially with the Big Ten. I think they got some question marks at the bottom of the league this year. They might be able to take advantage of that. But um, I think Porter, this isn't taking anything away from him, but I think he took a, uh, advantage of a Missouri Valley without Creighton, without um, you know Wichita State, and, and kind of became the class of that, that conference. Uh, we got three other Missouri Valley teams kind of in different spots here, Joe. Brian Wardle kind of established himself as a, as a middle of the pack, and then and they've won a couple Missouri Valley tournaments there. Brian Mullins early in his tenure at Southern Illinois. And then you got Dan Moore, who I thought years ago might have them poised to be that next team in the Valley, but boy, they've, they've declined in recent years. Are you buying any of those programs uh, the next couple of years? Well, I mean, Wardle, they were besieged by hit hard with, with injuries and, and um, uh, you know, off the court issues too, suspensions, things like that. So that, that hurt this year, I, you know, uh, it, this is a prime example of what's happened in college basketball again at that I talked about that mid-major level I mean they are they're, they're coming in and out you know as you know one example there's a high profile transfer Ray J Dennis out of Oswego East went off to Boise State uh, he, he's been in the portal and you know talking to these coaches Southern Illinois Bradley they're right in there they're, with that kid and you know that's how they are going to elevate themselves you have got to make a move in that transfer portal. Uh, you know, Loyola is, is the cream of the crop right now in the Missouri Valley. Northern Iowa uh, is, is going to be very good next year. Um, but those three, yeah, they are in flux. You know, I, I, I you know, right now I like it. If Southern Illinois can add a piece with, with Marcus Domask and, and, and Lance Jones back, um, you know, 
Brian Mullins, I think, is, is, is he's just got to get a higher level talent. Yeah. You look, they're not full of talent, but man, they play hard, they play smart, they play the way you would expect Brian Mullins, the way he played as a player. And uh, am I buying any of the programs right now? Right now, they're all in the middle of the pack. They need to make a move. Uh, and I just, none of them right now are, are, are poised to challenge for a, you know, a Missouri Valley title right now. But again, Jeremy, you, you call and we talk. We did this a month from now. Um, <laughs> rosters can change like that. I mean, it, it, I've never, it's never been like this in the history of the game, uh, in the history of the sport. It's not a good place to be in as a sport. I think the sport is really, really hurting right now. Uh, and I think college coaches would agree in a lot of different ways. Uh, but that, that thing is able to, to, to flip on a dime if you have the, you know, the right transfers coming in. And, and, but then you got the whole process of how do they fit in? Are they going to fit in? You get the players, and then you got to wait for them to come to see how it all mold melt, uh, kind of comes together. Right. And that's not an easy task either. Yeah. So I don't know if I should ask you about some of these other programs that are there early um, Western Illinois, Illinois, Chicago, obviously are in their second years uh, with Rob Jeter and Luke Yaklich and Eastern Illinois, Northern Illinois have first year coaches. Marty Simmons was an interesting hire for Eastern and, and Rashawn Bruno for Northern. Joe, I've always thought Northern, man, that's a nice basketball arena. It's not far from Chicago. I just, it's, it's the Mac felt like that, that that's a program, but uh, any thoughts on those four schools? Well, I mean, like you said, Western Illinois and UIC are year two. Uh, Luke Yaklich and, and Rob Jeter, just, just it, it's just laying the foundation. That's where they're at right now. Uh, Northern, you bring that up. It's an, I've known Rashawn Bernal for years, 15 years. He was a high school coach at Marmion when I met him up here in the Aurora area 15 years ago. I mean, he's already got some work. He's done some work. He's getting Keyshawn Williams from Bloom. Um, the, 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 you know, he's right there with Martise Mitchell, another transfer out of Minnesota. Uh, he, he's got a kid coming from Arizona State where he came from. So he's got a lot of work done uh, in, in a short amount of time. And to your point about Northern, I mean, I, I again, a lot of people view it as one of the two or three worst jobs in the MAC. Right. That, that the Western or the Eastern part of the, of the conference the Ohio's, but the, the point is the Western side is not very strong. So you can win. You can have success. Uh, it's been a tough thing to recruit to Northern for, for various reasons. Um, I, I think it's a school where a lot of suburban kids rule out because it's not an attractive place to go. Uh, you know, but they, 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 they have had some success way back when with, with suburban and you look at the football program they, they lived on suburban kids and, and done done a fabulous job of, of of elevating the football program over 15 years but you know i like the potential with Rashawn Bruno, and he's a bulldog man he gets after it uh i think i think there's no doubt he's going to get players to northern illinois this year next year you know the whole question mark then has become you know an assistant who, who's taken over as a head coach can he coach you know and um, you know, Rashawn is, is uh, got a great track record history of, of, of being this tough, competitive guy, and uh, I would I would expect his teams to play that way. Uh, so yeah, I I, I like the, the the direction that Northern's going right now. Joe, I, I got a bigger picture question to wrap this all up, but but first, um, I know you and I have talked, and you've said this before, like the state just hasn't had as much talent as it normally has, whether it's you know, guys leaving the state or just not having the, the highest level talent here in recent classes. It seems like there's, there's some classes here, especially 23 coming up uh, that, that could be really interesting. Just what, what do you think of 22, 23, 24 coming up? Well, you said it, Jeremy, you just said it. one of the things you mentioned was guys leaving the state. And in and, and my eyes, the number two and three ranked players in 2023 left the state. Uh, they, you know, with the whole COVID issue now, there's some talk that both of them could come back. That's Jeremy Fears, Jeremy Fears Jr., who was at Joliet West. Uh, he left to go to prep school. Uh, Matt Taspuzelis, uh from uh, Hinsdale Central. Uh, he was kind of under the radar. Not a lot of people had talked about him or, or knew much about him. Uh, but he went out to Brewster Academy out east, and he's he's been killing it and, and attracting a lot of high majors. Those are two high major guys that left the state. 
hopefully they come back for my sake and all the, all the people in Illinois uh, will enjoy high school basketball. would love to see them back. Uh, they still, they could still come back, but yeah, at that 20, you know, going to young group, I watched JJ Taylor boy, uh, this weekend. Um, he's a special, special talent. Uh, he's at Kenwood now, obviously started at Morgan park, transferred to Ken with Mike Irvin plays with the Mac Irvin fire. You would think Illinois would be front and center in that situation with their relationship with the Irvins and Mac Irvin fire. And, you know, he's a six, seven, uh, electric athlete with a fun game. He, he, he's a type of player we haven't seen in Illinois, that long rangy six, seven, six, eight wing, you know, for whatever reason, we, we haven't had hardly any of those types of players. Well, I don't know, over the last 10 years. Um, so it, 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 that's exciting. You know, Cameron Christie, Max Christie's younger brother, has got a chance to be a high major. Uh, Davis Lowry, he's up at um, uh, Kenwood, another kid, at six seven. I think Illinois offered him very early. Uh, Asa Thomas, he's a six six Kyle Corver like shooter up at Lake Forest High School. So that that class is good. Twenty twenty three. You move to twenty twenty two. AJ Casey is by far. Uh, the top talent in that class. He just looks the part. Again, the type of player, body, physical attributes we have not seen in Illinois. 6'8", filling out. Uh, he's agile, moves well. He's got a skill level, touch shooting it. He's a top 30 talent in the country. You know, he's going to be a tough get for anybody. Um, Blue Bloods will be involved. and But he is clearly the top of the class. Watched him this weekend. He plays with the Mean Streets on the AAU circuit. And then that next wave, uh, there's kind of two. I go Jaden Shoot, uh, Yorkville Christian, uh, who Illinois is involved with, and then Braden Huff at Glenbard West. Now, Jaden Shoot is one of the elite shooters I've seen in 25 years of doing this. Uh, just mechanical, the mechanics he has, uh, the elevation, release point, the consistency with that shot. He, he is an elite, elite shooter in, 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 a, in a sport right now that that's what people are coveting, are shooters. Uh, six, four, six, four and a half. He's got a surplus of Big Ten uh, offers. Just picked one up yesterday from Minnesota. Uh, and then Braden Huff is a six, nine, skilled foreman out of Glenbard West. You know, Virginia Tech, so, you know, out of Wisconsin's on him a little bit. Um, you know, and then you get into that next wave where this COVID thing is hurt. Uh, the development of uh, or the progress of or the simple evaluation process of guys like Jalen Quinn down at Tuscola near you, uh, Cam Kraft at Buffalo Grove. Um, you know, th those types of players have not been able to, you think about it, they missed all of last spring, all of the summer, didn't get to see them in high stakes AAU competition. Play this winter in a short abbreviated season where college coaches didn't go out, didn't watch. They were all locked in on their own deal. Uh, people like myself, we could only, I can only hit one game a night. There weren't shootouts. There weren't right. holiday tournaments to watch five, six games a day. So it was difficult to get a good read. So now we're finally getting back into the little bit of normalcy in this evaluation period for myself in the spring and for, and most fingers crossed June and July we're college coaches. That's the plan. It looks like it's going to go down that way where June and July, they're able to get back out and evaluate. You, you, you can't evaluate on this video, man. It, it's just, it, it, you know, you can get some very basic information or basic knowledge of what you think the player is, but you know, being away from it the way I was and being doing what I do in the evaluation process, it, it's literally impossible. Uh, so, you know, 2022 is, Okay, I mean, I, I, you know, Casey and Shoot are obviously the two, two guys at Illinois, I think, are, are, are front and center on and, and have a focus on. And then that 2023 group, if you get some of those guys that come back, pretty good looking group right now. Yeah. Uh, Joe, I want to ask you, um, AJ Store is an Illinois native from my neck of the woods. Kankakee played here a couple of years ago. Uh, I know he went out. He's one of those guys left the state, went to Compass Prep. Did, um, what, what did you think of him when he was here? And and what do you think of him now if you've been able to even see him? Yeah, that's that, that's <laughs> a – everybody always asks, Joe, who are your misses? Joe, who are the ones you, you really hit on? Uh, and, and, again, I, I hope he pans out. Uh, and, and I haven't seen him play. I've seen him play one time in, I don't know, a year and a half. Uh, 
he left the state. I was really intrigued with him. He is a, a very good athlete who shoots the heck out of it uh, with a good size. And I think about six, five. I mean, that alone is going to get you something, but it was interesting when he left, I had a, a, a view of him. I had an idea of what he was. And I had some guys call me because they knew parts of the country saw him and they would call and ask me, Joe, what do you think? I go, I don't think he's your level, man. I just don't think he's your level. But I mean, then I, I he was on a national television game. Um, I can't remember what it was. He played in an event down in Florida and he, he was a star. He, he, he went off and, and, and he impressed. I'm like, that wasn't the same guy I saw. You know, he knocks some, well, I should say he knocked some shots down. Right. You know, he's got a it's skill level got to improve. Got to put, put on the deck, handle it better. Um, intensity level, I'm sure, either has to rev up or it did since I last saw him. That was another kind of question. But there was no denying that his upside, his ceiling was pretty high. And I would not have guessed that he would trans, you know, transform into a high major. But that is not saying that he's not a high major. It's just I haven't been able to evaluate him anywhere near like I can the Illinois kids. But good, very good athlete who can really shoot it off the wing with some nice size and a, and a good looking body. Yeah, definitely. Uh, all right, Joe. So you kind of mentioned this, uh, that the game, the college game might not be in a good spot right now. Just what is the state of college basketball right now? Because it is going through so many changes with the transfer portal. Um, and, and as you mentioned, you know, all, all these different things, we got NIL coming up here, uh, but it definitely is a, a different game of roster construction, but just, just what are your overall thoughts about where this is all going? Well, I think for the fan, it's hard because of the, the lack of continuity and the lack of familiarity. Uh, you know, I just think back to me growing up and, and, and you yourself and, and, and you can identify with certain teams and players and get comfortable and get excited about it. Uh, I mean, I can't even keep track of, I can't keep track of rosters. I can't keep track of anything anymore. I think that takes away from, it's almost like, okay, wake me up in, in, in November when, when, when October, when practice starts and I'll see what the rosters, I, I can't do that with my job I have, but I, from that perspective, it's just, I don't know. I think it takes a little bit of the, the connective, like the connection you have with, with teams and programs as a fan. Uh, from a coach's standpoint, we talked about the challenges of maintaining and, 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 and you, you build your roster, you build your program. And I, and I keep going back to Porter Mosier. You know, he's, he's just, it's going to be interesting to see how he handles it because a guy like him or coaches like him, they don't really want to have these hodgepodge. I'm adding pieces like multiple five, six pieces a year. I mean, we see rosters now are, are, are changeover by a half dozen to eight players. Uh, and, and it's a, it can be a quick fix. I just don't think it's healthy and I don't think it's a, it's a fun way to build a team or to get connected and watch a team. Uh, and for whatever reason, I don't have an answer to this one. I just feel like the talent level overall is really down right now in college basketball. I, I you know, I, and, it, and you're always comparing to previous years, right? I mean, Ohio State this year, really good team, really good. good example. Are they a typical number three seed in an NCAA tournament? I mean, I, I mean, EJ Liddell, I, no one loves EJ Liddell more than I do. I love him. Is he the best? typical best player on a, you know, on a, on a three seed team, I'm just using Ohio state as an example. Uh, but I think there's a lot of these teams that you could go through in the NCAA tournament and look at their two and three seed. And I, I thought Baylor and Gonzaga were as legit, as good as any team that we've had. And I don't know. I mean, obviously college basketball is not anywhere it was in the eighties and the nineties when everybody stayed to their juniors and seniors, those days are done. But uh, you go back the last 20 years, I mean, Gonzaga and this year's, Gonzaga and, and Baylor seem as good as they get. The way Illinois was playing at the end, there was legitimacy there as them being a super high-level team. And But, I mean, I love when the Blue Bloods are down, uh, but <laughs> just because of, of, of a selfish basketball standpoint. But when you have Kentucky, Duke, Carolina, and Kansas kind of in the, the situations they're in, and you throw an Arizona in there, I, you know, that, I like it but it, I don't think it's very good for college basketball. Um, and, 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 and when those teams are as down as they've been, 
uh, you, you kind of get a, a, an understanding of how the talent level in college hoops is, is down. And, and, and then that's not, you know, I don't think college basketball coaches talk too much publicly about that, but in all my conversations I had with almost, you know, 80% of them, they're all, we would all agree that college basketball just is not at a real high level right now. So, so Joe, I mean, we have this transfer portal. This is a one-time transfer. It's going to start this year. Um, and is this just the initial push? And then there will be, do you think the players start to realize, hey, that's not the best thing? Or is this just here to stay? Like, do you think there's going to be a reaction from the player side? Because the coaches, I mean, they don't have much. Brad Underwood said, like, the power is in their hands now. And I think that is very difficult for all these coaches who have had the control for so long. Now that the players have control, will they react to it? Will uh, parents react to it? Will uh, high school AAU coaches react to it? Well, this is, I'm going to answer that in a second. Another point I was going to make about the college game is what coaches have commented about. It's so hard to coach now. I mean, they, they, they are, you know, some of those old school guys that get into you uh, and, and, you know, they're hard on you, but they show you love as well. Uh, sometimes that's not enough. And, and they are out the door. I mean, they are really struggling with how to manage rosters, how to manage personalities, uh, attitudes, expectations, because they know that they're out the door uh, and, and, they, and they just leave. So that, that's another negative of the sport right now uh, is just how much can you invest in these kids when – the way you want to knowing in the back of your mind, they might be outdoor uh, the first, whether I bench you or, or, you know, discipline or whatever it is um, lack of playing time. That, that's hard to navigate for, for a college coach. Uh, you know, I, I just think the, the, the transfer portal has a lot of, it's not just the transfer portal right now, Jeremy, it is this, just ridiculous decision the NCAA move that made before we knew what was going to happen with COVID and what was going to happen with the season where you made every, you granted everybody an extra year of eligibility. And now, and that, you know, a lot of people don't realize, you know, the avid fans do, but it's not just the seniors that get to come back. It's these freshmen, sophomores, and juniors who, if they want to add an extra year, so this is going to cycle through. I feel really bad. Everybody's worried about the class of 2021 in, 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 in the country uh, and, and our kids here in Illinois. I worry. I have a big worry for the class of 2022. Yep. Uh, those top 12, 15 kids, they're, they're, they're going to find their place they're in their homes. But eventually, they're, they're not just – colleges aren't just going to give 18 scholarships, 17 scholarships every year. That has not been determined how they're going to handle that yet. You know, right now you can, they're, they're, they're granting that extra, um, you know, scholarships to those players and, and, and accepting the ones that are coming in as freshmen. But what are you doing down the road? What are you doing for you know, colleges? Western Illinois can't afford 17, 18 scholarships every single year. Uh, so eventually there's this backlog for another year or two, at least, where I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if, if, if prep schools become the route, if, if, if even more so than ever before, I mean, there's people like, Hey, I should open a prep school. Uh, you know, there's, it's really a mess, man. And, and I, I feel for, you know, the high school kids, um, how that works with the transfers in terms of when that's going to slow down. I think we just got to play it out I mean, I, I, and see the, the, how much misery, <laughs> there is with, with, with kids that, that transfer and get there like, well, I made another mistake uh, because now you're stuck. Or that enter the portal, Joe, and have nowhere to go. Oh, there's going to be kids in the portal. I guarantee you, if you look in the portal, August 1st, there's two, 300 kids still in the portal. Uh, there's just right now, if, if you're, if you're a, let's say a decent division one player and you're in the portal for more than three weeks and you don't have anything, <laughs> you're in trouble. Uh, and the other thing is these kids in the portal, and I'm dealing with this, with so there's so many transfers from Illinois, uh, homegrown, you know, uh, natives of Illinois in college basketball that are out there that are in the portal. Not, I mean, there is a lengthy, lengthy list of them. And so I'm dealing with some of that, whether it be families or high school coaches or college coaches checking in and, 
and you know asking for some ideas about their character and all just the whole gamut of, of research and um going down the line of the evaluation process but you, you look at it and if if the coach if you don't jump on it the college they're on to another kid two three weeks later because there's oh there's another dozen new gains in the portal today so it, it is a game that is very hard to kind of forecast what the future is going to be yeah. Well, Joe Hendrickson, City Suburban Hoops Report, you're, you're the man that I wanted to go to for this, and you delivered, man. Uh, appreciate it, as always, breaking down the state, both with talent and the uh, the programs. And it's going to be interesting, the new normal, I guess, of college basketball. We'll see, uh, you know, how we look back at it in three, four, or five years and how everything's changed. Well, what's your take? I mean, uh, 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 on the <laughs> yeah, no, on, I'm, the, on the new normal. I, I'm glad you asked, Joe, because I, I am of the opinion that, hey, if Porter Moser wants to go get a job, he should be able to go get a job anywhere he wants, right? Um, or if a player wants to transfer, he should be able to transfer. But there's also part of me that's like, hey, I think you should try and tough this out a little bit more. Like the first sign of adversity, don't run away. Maybe test yourself a little bit, see what comes of it. Uh, because I think we've seen with, with a lot of players, Joe, that – it doesn't work out freshman, sophomore year, but by their junior, senior year, they're really, really good players and they're, they're better in the long term from not running away from that adversity. Now, other kids have legitimate reasons to leave, whether it's to be closer to family, whether it's because that opportunity uh, didn't work out and it's not the best thing for them. Um, so I'm kind of in the middle of this. I think players need um, to be able to, to move freely if coaches are able to f move freely. But I also think it does hurt the product a little bit. It hurts the fan part of it as well. And I think some of these guys are getting really bad advice when, when they enter, enter the transfer portal. And, um, you know, I think there's some guys that handle this pretty well and, and the other guys that, that aren't. So I think we're allowing these guys to make more mistakes than, than they have. And I think we're dealing with the ramifications of it. And what's been lost, one more thing, is just the, the – process the development the of the player and that instant gratitude just is not always going to be there and and that has led to a lot of the transfers that whether it be man you're going to have your moment you're going to have your time maybe you aren't ready for whatever you're at right now wherever level you're at right now but give us some time man i mean just because I, I, I don't know. I, this is the topic to go on and on. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't want to be like old man shaking my fist at the air about this. But you're, you're right, Joe. Like there is a process. And I think the kids who are around people that say, hey, this is a process. Like the, the one guy, I mean, he was a questionable take for Illinois. Like Brandon Leap, right, was a questionable take for Illinois. But that kid is bought into the process. Like he knows I'm not going to go to Illinois and play right away, but if I commit myself for the next two, three years, probably three, then maybe I have a chance to be really good at the big 10 level. And that's, that's a roll of the dice for Illinois, but um, they love the kid because he is committed to that process. So, and Coleman Hawkins is another one that instead of just tearing it up at a, at a high school in California, he decides to go to prolific prep, challenge himself, be a role player. And, you know, here at Illinois, he didn't pout very much when he didn't have a role right away. And, and now he looks like he's a key piece next year and, and beyond. So I, I like that those kids seem to have, you know, the understanding of the development and the process in their mind. Yeah. I, I just, the, the negatives, I, I see the positives and you know, one of the big one you mentioned with the coach leaving, I mean, that, that's a extremely valid point. Uh, if they can leave, well, why can't a college kid and, and why do they have to sit out? I, I it's just that there's so many negatives that I see in the game and the sport. And, you know, I'll give you another one real quick, you know, that, that people aren't really aware of that that's, it's gross. And it's, you know, be January 12th or February 1st and I'll get college coaches to call and ask me about kids that are playing <laughs> for another, they're still in the lineup and playing at a, you know, whether it be in their league or, or somewhere else in the country and, and, and getting the lowdown on, Hey, is that kid leaving? Or, Hey, I heard that. Can you reach out to that family or like, man, no, I mean, let, let, you know, if the family comes to me, it's a little different scenario, but I mean, just to be the vultures uh, and, and it's, that's the game that, and that's the sport and that's the cutthroat of high stakes, high, particularly at the high major level. And uh, the, the, the dirtiness that's out there in the sport that I love and that I work in and I work so closely with is, I got to tell you, man, it, it, it's just, 
it's gotten worse and worse. And, and, and that's just one aspect of it. I, I mean, let's just gonna leave, let, them, not, let, like, let them get in the. Yeah. I, I know we're not going to put. Get there first. Yeah, I know we're not going to put the genie back in the bottle here, but would the answer have been, would an easy answer, Joe, have been if a coach leaves blanket waiver for all those kids to leave if they want to? Like, would that, would that have been, hey, let's try this first before we just open everything? Yeah, I, I like that. I mean, I, I mean, they do it. If you think about it, they do it for the most part right. when the freshman is signed and they, they let them out of their letter of intent. That used to even be a fight. They'd be like, we're not letting you out. We're going to make it difficult for you. You know, and, and now that's pretty much a given. You know, what, what, what happened, Jeremy, is that the, the, where this all went south was the NCAA didn't have the guts and the balls to do certain things. And that means the waiver process. First of all, it was a tough waiver process. I, I don't. I don't know why they ever needed the waiver. You know, the, I get the sick family member or, you know, but then all of a sudden it became more than that. Uh, and then all of a sudden everybody's getting a waiver. Uh, and, and then the NCAA is like, well, they just threw their hands up and said, forget it. We're going to everybody waivers. Now we're just going to do everything. So, I mean, that's the, that's, that's the, the process of how it got to this point uh, is, is the beginning of the waiver and the, the, the grad, uh, the fifth year grad. Uh, those two things just exploded and were taken so advantage of because there were so many loopholes that the NCAA provided. And then it just became a tidal wave and they just threw their hands up and said, we're done. We, we're not doing this anymore. We can't manage it. Just let everybody transfer. And, and that's, that's where we are now. Yeah. I'm just very interested to see if there's a reaction to it. Um, you know, like Brad Underwood is, you could tell the other day, he's like, I have to rethink my entire philosophical approach to building a roster. Uh, yeah. So it will be interesting to see what he does, whether he goes more transfers, because then he said they can't transfer again without penalty. So maybe it's easier to keep those guys than prep guys. Yeah. Um, so who, who takes these kids first will be, would be the biggest uh, question, I guess. Well, Joe, I, I appreciate the conversation, man. I don't know if we got the answers, but we certainly covered it. <laughs> no, it was fun, Jeremy. Anytime. It was, it was a lot of fun.